Well, good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi à vous tous. Je m'appelle Caroline Blouin et je suis... I'm Caroline Blouin and I'm Vice President at the, uh, yeah, the FSRA. And so I am very, very happy to open our session today. Bonjour. The EVP of Pensions at FESRA, the Financial Services uh, Regulatory Authority of Ontario. It is my pleasure to be here and open our session today. I am joined by Tamara DeMoss, Managing Director, Private Pension Plans Division at OSFI, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions of Canada. It's been a real pleasure working in partnership with OSFI over the past year and truly a clear tangible step towards our desire for increased collaboration and harmonization where possible. So thank you, Tamara, to you and your entire team. Truly the past year has felt like we were just one big team um, and we look forward to more of these opportunities to collaborate in the future. So now on to logistical items. Um, to begin, I'd like to let you know that this information session is available to listen to in the official language of your choice. Um, so you can click the interpretation button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It looks like a little globe. Um, if you select English, you will hear interpretation in English for any French spoken. If you select French, you will hear interpretation in French for any English spoken. And if you don't want to hear any interpretation, don't touch anything, you're perfect. Um, alors en français, pour commencer, je tiens so à préciser... To happy, I would like to say that you can follow our webinar in the official language of your choice, thanks to the interpreter who is present today. So if you want to have access to acts to simultaneous interpretation, all you need to know is that to click on the button that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, it looks like a little globe. And if you pick English, you will hear the English into English of anything that is said in French. And conversely, if you click on French, you will hear in French anything that is being said in English. And if you do not click or, or pick on anything at all, well, and you don't need interpretation, well, you're good to go. Don't click on anything. Now I would like to open officially our session with a land acknowledgement. So land acknowledgements are important and meaningful. It's a gesture and step towards reconciliation for the injustices that have been carried out against our Indigenous communities. Please join me in a moment of silence to set our intentions on truth and reconciliation. Let's take a moment to acknowledge the wonderful land on which we're meeting. My FISRA colleagues and I are speaking from Toronto and the land on which we're gathering is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, Métis, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. And now it's the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And my colleagues and I from OSFI are mostly speaking from Ottawa. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on land that has long served as a meeting place amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Algonquin people. And we recognize that those of you joining us today may work on different traditional Indigenous territory. We invite you to reflect upon what this means for you. I know our presenters are super excited to share with you the outcomes of the joint FISRA 
Drought and OSFI Technical Advisory Committee on Defined Contribution Pension Plans. We've saved some time at the end to uh, address your questions at the end of the webinar. I want to remind you that if you have a plan specific questions about your own defined contribution plans or a DC plan that you support, we're happy to take those on, but let's schedule a separate meeting either through OSFI or FESRA after the webinar today. Um, so over the past year, so since December 2020 until the end of the summer, we worked with a wonderful committee. Um, so I want to acknowledge and thank all of the committee members who have supported us. You see their names here. Thank you so much. So it was a committee of 18 members. And when we constituted the meeting, we really paid a lot of attention to ensuring we were representing diverse perspectives from the sector. So we have representations, as you can see here, from labor, lawyers, uh, plans supervised by OSFIs, plans supervised by FISRA. We tried to incorporate different size of plans as well. Um, we had MEBCO that was represented, brokers, all of the life codes, almost all of the life codes um, were represented. So thank you so very much. And then we had uh, professional and industry uh, representation as well. So overall, it was totally tremendous. I know it was a, a big ask. We met many times, but thank you very much. And um, we're so thrilled to be sharing the results of our consultation process with you, um, with the sector. I also want to acknowledge and thank our colleagues at CRA, the Ministry of Ontario, uh, of Finance in Ontario, and Finance Canada for being present and attending every single committee meeting, being engaged in the discussion and really listening to what the sector is saying. Um, all of us working together in the ecosystem is so important uh, to ensure the effectiveness and efficiency of the sector. So the goal of our work together with the committee was to find ways to improve outcomes for DC pension plan members and um, also to enhance regulatory efficiency and effectiveness for DC plans. And of course, to celebrate my birthday. We had a committee meeting on my birthday. And I will forever remember very fondly OSFI and the committee singing happy birthday to me. Um, it was so terrific and touching. Um, just thinking about the memory brings back uh, a smile and a lot of brightness to my heart. Um, and dear audience, we have a surprise for you. I hear that OSFI has prepared a song to start us off. So I'll turn it over to Tamara to uh, start us off. Ah, yes, funny one, Carolyn. <laughs> I think we would very much so like to not scare to people start off. Us off. So I'll turn it over to Tamara. Uh, yes, I, I think that we very much like not to not scare people off. I'm not sure if any of you have attempted to have choruses through Teams or Zoom, but my experience has proven this to be a bit challenging and, and in fact, a little bit scary. Um, thank you, Carolyn. Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi à tous. I'm delighted to be here today, and I hope you find this session useful and insightful. Uh, I would also like to say how much we here at OSPI have enjoyed working with FISRA on this en endeavor. Um, I also want to thank the TAC committee for all their, uh, their contributions. People have often asked us why we decided to embark on, on this joint collaboration. And Carolyn and I shared bilaterals where we discuss our priorities. And in one of these sessions, it came up that improving our supervision of defined contribution pension plans was a high priority for both of us. So it was just natural that we decided to uh, collaborate on this effort. You will see in the presentation today that the Technical Advisory Committee, or TAC as we call them, 
thought that we should go even further and that in fact, the guidance should be extended to across Canada through recommendations to the CAPSEC Capital Accumulation Plans and Guideline Committee. The Joint FISRA OSPE Technical Advisory Committee on Defined Contribution Pension Plans was an important part of FISRA and OSPE's stakeholder engagement process because it created a process for two-way dialogue and understanding, assisting both regulators in developing better processes, guidance, and approaches to its regulation of the pension sector, and ways to harmonize supervisory approaches to improve regulatory efficiency and effectiveness. One thing that I should mention is that OSFI and FISR's responsibilities do not extend to making changes to the applicable pension standards legisl legislation. For federal pension legislation, this is the Federal Department of Finance. And for Ontario pension legislation, this is the Ontario Ministry of Finance. In that same spirit of creating a two-way dialogue, I wish you a good se session. I encourage you to ask questions. And as Carolyn mentioned, we have left time at the end to respond to these questions. We want this to be an interactive session. Therefore, we'll ask that you submit any questions via this application called Slido. To access Slido, please open another browser on your computer or mobile device and go to slido.com. And you can note uh, the, the slide also has instructions there. So we're asked, please enter the event code FISRA OSFI, F-S-R-A O-S-F-I. And the passcode is the same, FISRA OSFI, F-S-R-A O-S-F-I. Once logged in, you can submit your questions. You can also vote for the questions you'd like us to answer. To properly view our session today, please go to the top right corner of your Zoom screen and click on the View button. From there, select Side by Spot Side Speaker. This will ensure that the presentation and active speaker, speaker are the focal point at all times. Once again, welcome to the webinar. And I'll now invite our first presenters, James Hoffner from FISRA and Mike Use from OSPE to share the tax recommendations for strengthening the CAPSA CAP guidelines. Thank you, Tamara. Today, my colleague James from, and I will be walking through the recommendations of the Technical Advisory Committee that were submitted to CAPSA for consideration when reviewing the CAP guidelines. We thought it might help to provide a little bit of context to the DC plans that OSFI and FISRA regulate. As you can see from the slide, FISRA and OSFI regulate many DC plans with a wide variance of size. DC plans represent about three quarters of individual pension plans regulated by each. However, only approximately 13 to 14% of members and 4% of assets. In terms of membership, about 7% of these plans have more than 500 members and about 15% of DC plans have more than $10 million in assets. This shows that the vast majority of DC plans are small. However, we do need to recognize that both FISRA and OSFI have DC plans with assets over $1 billion and several more with more than 100 million. This illustrates the diversity of the DC world in which the committee is making these recommendations. I'll turn it over to James to describe the process by which the committee came up with these recommendations. James? Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. As Carolyn, as Carolyn and Tamara had described, the committee had several informed candid discussions. <clears throat> Over time, certain ideas began to gel about how to have good DC plan experiences. OSFI and FISRA had thought initially that this input could be used to create new guidance for their respective jurisdictions. The committee suggested, however, that the ideas should be shared with CAPSA to consider for the CAP guidelines. This approach made sense for a few reasons. First, CAPSA is in the process of reviewing the CAP guidelines, which haven't been materially modified since they were introduced in 2004. The timing of CAPSA's review and the joint ostfi fisr committee is a fortuitous coincidence. Second, and fundamentally, improving existing guidance is important for regulatory harmony and efficiency. We know the CAP guidelines are widely accepted within the broader CAP sector. It makes sense to work with them. Third, the recommendations could be relevant to the administration of other CAP plans that are not DC plans. 
This is why the committee is making its recommendations to CAPSA. If you've already read or skimmed the recommendations, you'll note that they're pitched at a conceptual level. To appreciate why we did this, I'll emphasize how the recommendations originated. As mentioned, they emerge from discussions about how the experiences of DC plan members can be made better. We didn't sit down as a committee to specifically critique the CAP guidelines. Instead, the committee focused its collective experience to identify areas of current activities that can be improved. As a result, there are some instances where there are recommendations for change and there are already existing guidelines on the issue. In these instances, the recommendation should be understood as encouraging CAPSA to consider whether the existing guidelines can go further or be given different emphasis to better signal the appropriate considerations and supervisory expectations. It's also important to note the committee was quite aware of the need to get the balance right in terms of governance burden. DC and other CAP plans are voluntary in nature. Supervisory expectations should not be counterproductive by making it too onerous for employers to offer these plans. The objective is to facilitate better plan member outcomes in a manner that is sensitive to the context in which the plans are offered. Finally, pension professionals are a passionate group. So while these recommendations reflect the overall view of the committee, they may not in each instance reflect the view of a particular committee member. Nonetheless, the recommendations reflect the practices and the views of many leading plans and service providers. With that, I'll turn things back over to Mike to explain the first recommendation, outcome-focused decision-making. Thank you, James. Throughout our working group meetings, the committee repeatedly came back to the importance of purpose as the key principle to guide decision-making. Purpose provides a framework for decision-making, the type of information to provide, as well as the appropriateness of services and fees. Purpose brings into focus what is important in the plan, and the committee felt that the guidance could go further in making this concept more resonant in plan governance activities. A clear sense of purpose focuses attention to the areas that produce the biggest impact on retirement income. And the committee also agreed that a lifetime retirement income is a more accurate description of the purpose of plan than savings. It is, after all, a pension plan. With that in mind, consider the following decisions that have a significant impact on member outcomes. First, simply participating in a plan. Auto enrollment and eligibility criteria are key points to look at here. The sooner a member participates in a CAP plan, the better the outcome is likely to be. Second, greater and earlier contributions. Features like higher default contribution rates and auto escalation of contributions help ensure members maximize their potential outcomes. That said, this is where we maybe can add a caveat. The committee recognized that in some plan situations, specifically where plan members may have a lower income, a DC pension plan may not always be the best way to maximize the member outcome. For example, some indicated that a TFSA may be a better vehicle because it's an after-tax product, whereas payments from a pension plan are treated as income, which can result in a reduction of certain government benefits. This should be considered when designing the plan. Finally, appropriate investment selections. This is an area that has received a lot of attention in the past. That said, this aspect of plan design could further benefit from approaching it with member outcomes in mind. We'll go into more details on this in a later recommendation. Considering member outcomes can also be useful for assessing the effectiveness of the plan design for delivering the plan's intended, uh, intended outcomes. While plan design is less the plan administrator's concern, plan sponsors will want to consider how their designs are delivering on the intended outcomes. Attention to outcomes can serve to differentiate the characteristics of different CAP plans and assist plan sponsors in choosing the CAP plan or combination of CAP plans most suitable for this purpose. Member engagement can sometimes be a challenge, which makes these features even more important. This leads us to our next recommendation, member engagement as a pillar of success. I'll turn things over to you, James. 
Great, thanks, Mike. As everyone on this call will know, DC plans, by definition, require members to bear certain risks and related to that, take certain actions. Members therefore have to be engaged to make good decisions to lead to good outcomes. But we know member engagement faces several challenges, including financial literacy, capacity to save, and competing interests for people's time. And we know that member engagement is an important priority and focus of the sector. The committee discussed how plans have approached engagement. It's an area where service providers compete to differentiate themselves and digital capabilities are expected to continue to get better. So there's a lot of good activity happening around engagement. The committee's recommendation is for CAPSA to consider how the guidelines can further support the sector with engagement. In a sense, the CAP guidelines set out what information should be provided to, pl to plan members. The issue here is for consideration of how information should be provided to plan members. For instance, there has been much written about techniques for communicating information effectively, such as using plan language and framing information to attract attention and facilitate decision making. The committee also noted that an engaged employer can play an important role in creating trust in plan communications. These are examples of insights that plan administrators can use in assessing whether their plan communications are being made effectively. Retirement income projections and plan member statements were also topics of discussions. As will not be a surprise to people on this call, the committee viewed account balance information on its own as somewhat limited, as somewhat incomplete. It's a number that's a bit abstract on its own. An income projection, on the other hand, gives the account balance some context. Projections enable members to better understand the course they're on in terms of what their retirement income might look like and recognize whether they need or want to consider a course correction. The committee looked at model DC plan member statements from the UK and European regulators. We included some links to these statements in the recommendations. If you have a chance to look at them, you'll see they prioritize income projections on the first page. They use infographics and in color. They keep the message simple. They explain how member can take action and they defer less important information to subsidiary pages and other documents. In the committee meetings, it was discussed how statement designs in Canada are trending in this direction, but are often weighed down with, with a lot of information to convey. We also discussed the issue of the continuing relevance of statements, given the increased digital access to account information. To step back and summarize, for member engagement, the recommendation coming out of the committee is for CAPSA to consider including in the CAP guidelines, principles focused on effective communication. Essentially, the recommendation is to support the entire sector and taking advantage of the latest insights into member engagement practices. With that, I'll turn things over to Mike for the next recommendation. Great, thanks James. So the next recommendation surrounds investments. Given the developments in the nearly two decades since the CAP guidelines were introduced, the committee recommends that more specific guidance should be provided regarding, regarding appropriate default fund selection as well as the investment lineup principles. First, the committee was clear that setting short-term investments as a default option, such as a money market fund, is generally not appropriate for plan members that likely have long-term investment horizons, and the guidance should reflect this. The low returns these funds offer, coupled with fees and the effects of inflation, present challenges. Although members may rely on other sources of income in their retirement, for many, a cap plan is the backbone of their retirement planning. As a result, and given the challenges of member engagement, the default option should be suitable as the core of a member's investments. Newer fund types have emerged since the introduction of the cap guidelines, such as target date, target risk, and other fund of fund types. And in many cases, plans have set these fund types as the default option where no choice over asset allocation is actively made by the member. 
This move towards more appropriate fund choices is supported by legislation in BC and Alberta, as well as PRPP and VRSP plans across Canada. Going back to recommendation one, which focused on member outcomes, administrators should ask themselves whether the amount of choices available to members actually facilitate portfolios that deliver better outcomes for members. Anecdotally, I've seen plans with over 100 fund options. The committee noted that the, the committee noted the importance of behavioral economics when choosing an investment lineup. While there are plans in which members are more engaged and additional choices may be acceptable, lineups with fewer investment options for members are generally considered to lead to better member outcomes. This has the benefit of more efficient governance of the plan as well. It requires less work on due diligence of these additional funds in order to meet the standards of care and fiduciary obligations. With that, I'll turn it back over to James to discuss the committee's fourth recommendation. James? Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, this recommendation is about underscoring, but also helping with the governance responsibilities of CAP plans. And there are two aspects to the recommendation. First, uh, the recommendation is to recognize the common standards of governance and responsibility of all CAP plans, regardless of regulatory regime. So what are, what are we getting at here? In the committee discussions, there was a sense uh, that there exists a view or, or an understanding in the broader CAP sector that pension plans involve much more onerous governance standards than non-pension CAP plans. We didn't think this view is correct. We know that pension legislation and case law provides clarity for pension administrators about their fiduciary duty, but clarity on the pension side doesn't mean there aren't governance responsibilities and standards for other CAP plans. The view expressed in the committee was that all CAP plans, pension or not, at a practical level, involve the same governance practices and considerations. For example, in picking and overseeing investment lineups, in making decisions about fees and service providers, non-pension CAP plan sponsors and pension plan administrators need to make decisions that are appropriate for their plans. There are, without doubt, regulatory differences between pension and other CAP plans, but governance responsibilities uh, were not seen as materially different. The second aspect of this recommendation is to support plans in their governance. Even if activities are delegated to a service provider, there's still an oversight governance responsibility. But the challenge for many CAP plans is that governance is a side of the desk activity. If you recall our first slide, the majority of DC plans are comparatively small. So the recommendation is for CAPSA to consider creating a governance tool that is more attuned to the CAP context, that allows plans to take a proportionate but still meaningful approach to governance. Of course, there is CAPSA's existing governance guideline. It's a good guideline, but it was also written in part with DB plans in mind, which have some differences to DC plans. What's envisioned here is something that's more efficient and tailored to the, D, to the DC and CAP plan context. This brings me to the end of the governance regulate, uh, recommendation. I'll let Mike take it from here. Thank you, James. The committee's fifth recommendation surrounds value for money. Investment and administration decisions can have a significant impact on member outcomes over a lifetime of membership, and the guidelines should highlight the importance of this. To make informed decisions about value, plan administrators need to understand the fees being paid by the plan. The committee noted in many cases that there is a, there is a relatively low level of awareness of the main categories of fees pay, payable by plans among administrators and sponsors. And this gets back to, to the point James just mentioned about many DC plans being small side of the desk activities. And this is backed up by experience that OSFI has when it surveyed plans about their fees. Administrators and sponsors need to consider the reasonableness of all member born fees, not just the investment fees, when selecting options for the investment lineup. This is especially true when fees are paid by members on a monthly basis. This obviously requires an informed 
understanding of all services and related fees. While the guideline currently has wording around the different categories of fees, it could further break them down by providing definitions of fees and operating expenses, record keeping fees, and advisor, broker, and consultant fees. Additionally, the guideline could even offer administrators questions that they could ask to help them make informed decisions. Administrators should understand the value of each service in order to demonstrate its standard of care. One of the things we heard several times in the committee is that absolute low cost should not be the standard. Low costs are important, but so too are the services and investment strategies that can lead to better overall member outcomes. For example, ensuring that the fees paid actually achieve tangible benefits for members in terms of net return or services. Guidance could also highlight the importance of going to market on a periodic basis to ensure the plan has considered the available options and market price for all its service needs. Finally, conveying information about the value of the plan to members can be particularly relevant for those members when comparing the features of their plan, such as additional voluntary contributions, to other opportunities that they may have, such as RRSP or TFSA savings. Over to you, James, for the committee's final recommendation. Great, thanks, Mike. As people on this call uh, will understand, the accumulation or the payout phase presents several issues and risks for people to navigate. DC plans are good environments in which to accumulate wealth <clears throat> with the pooling of expenses and the oversight of, of plan administrators. But many, if not most, plan members will leave their plans when they reach retirement, if not before. We know there are some DC plans that offer in-plan benefits, but many other plans see challenges in offering these benefits. From a supervisory perspective, a consequence of this reality is that former DC plan members, when they reach the point of receiving retirement income, are typically outside the purview of pension supervision. Decumulation is nonetheless the necessary function or result in which the intended outcomes of DC plans are realized. The recommendation for CAPSA is to continue to think about how guidance can support plan administrators and members with decumulation. Members, of course, will need to understand their options for moving their money outside of the plan, if that's what they wish to do. Beyond that, plan members also need to understand how to draw down income from their pension savings. Investment risk allocation is important, but the committee noted that perhaps equally or more important are other issues like longevity and sequencing risks. Also important is understanding the interaction of plan member savings with government programs. If we go back to the first recommendation of the committee, outcome-focused decision-making, the recommended purpose for pension plans is to enable savings for the provision of retirement income. Having this purpose set out in the guidelines can help orient employers, plan administrators, and plan information and tools to support members transitioning out of their plans into decumulation. With that, I'll turn things back to Mike to conclude. Thank you, James. In the committee discussions, there were a lot of topics raised and ideas discussed about how to improve DC plan experiences. Uh, we tried to capture the essence of the key points, but there's a lot to unpack and we recognize that. We look forward to continuing the dialogue. I'll now pass it off to Jesse and Nadin to talk about the member guide. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi à tous. And thank you, Mike and James, for providing more insights on the recommendations for strengthening, strengthening the CAP guidelines. So before we jump to the DC member guide presentation, I will start by sharing a couple of interesting statistics. I know pension professionals just love to see numbers. Stat number one. According to the key findings from the 2019 Canadian Financial Capability Survey, published by the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada, or FCAC, only 69% of non-retired Canadians are preparing financially for retirement, either on their own or through a workplace pension. In fact, 
the survey noted that some Canadians are not saving at all. On a more positive note, this number increased slightly by 3% compared to the 2014 survey, which leads us to believe that Canadians are becoming increasingly aware of the need to save for retirement. Now, that's some better news. What the survey also noted is that among other factors, those with lower levels of financial knowledge are least likely to be aware of what exactly they need to save to retire comfortably. Stat number two. Now, if we shift our focus back to the DC plans environment that Mike and James presented at the beginning, we note that over 90% of Ontario and federal DC plans are member choice. What this means is that members must be engaged in decision-making and have adequate knowledge and understanding to make well-informed decisions in order to achieve their financial goals in retirement. So, how do we support DC plan members in being a good financial planner, a good investment expert, a good tax expert, and probably a good actuary too, so they can make appropriate projections and make sure they don't run out of money too soon? Piece of cake, right? Now, this leads us back to the committee's work. So while considering how we can improve outcomes for DC plans in general, the committee was of the view that member engagement and financial literacy play a significant role in improving outcomes for DC plan members. The committee also recognized that there is great value in the regulators communicating directly with plan members and providing them unbiased guidance. They felt that the, this would support members and plan administrators in creating an environment where members have access to information, resources, and tools to enable well-informed choices in retirement planning. In addition, the committee noted that partnerships with other entities could be useful in order for such guidance to have a greater visibility and reach a broader audience. If we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you, David. So, after several work group discussions, a plain language member-focused guide was developed with the committee to encourage member engagement with their retirement savings and support mentor, member education and a better understanding of DC plans. So the guidance is intended for DC plan members and was designed to help members understand key decisions they need to make regarding their DC plan. It also provides tools to make well-informed financial and retirement planning decisions through the use of examples to help demonstrate different outcomes. So now that we have this great tool, how do we distribute it to plan members? So the committee approached CAPSA with the guide and CAPSA endorsed the DC member guide. So in fact, the guide is officially a CAPSA document. At the end of October, 2021, CAPSA launched the guide on their website and shared the document with all CAPSA member jurisdictions to increase its visibility. Note that the guide is also available on OSPI's and FISRA's websites and can be made available to DC plan members, by plan administrators, and other industry participants. In addition, to add to the good news, FCAC also decided to promote the guide and make it available on their website. In fact, the timing of the guide uh, of the DC member guide release is absolutely perfect. It coincides with FCAC's 2021 Financial Literacy Month that just launched in November, and FCAC announced the guide in their November 2021 Financial Literacy Newsletter. This is really great in terms of distribution and reaching a larger audience. So this summarizes the why and how the CAPSA member guide for DC pension plans came to life. And now, without any further delay, I will hand over the mic to, Jess, to my colleague, Jesse at FISRA, who will give a brief overview of the DC member guide. Over to you, Jesse. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, Nadine, for providing all that great background and context on the DC member guide. Um, so my name is Jesse heath -Rawlings. I'm the Senior Policy and Technical Lead on FISRA's Pension Policy Team, and I'm just going to take a few minutes right now to provide a bit of an overview of some of the content of the guide. 
Um, so as Nadine mentioned, the document's intended to provide some background information on DC plans and to assist members in making some of those important decisions that they may need to make with respect to their plan. For that reason, it's intended to be written in simple and accessible plain language and to use a variety of visual aids to help reinforce some important concepts. Um, you'll see as I'm speaking on the slides, uh, some excerpts from the document. Don't worry about trying to read these in full right now. They're all just examples that can be found in the guide. We really just wanted to put them on the slides to provide a bit of an illustration as to what the guide looks like for you. So uh, just speaking generally, the DC member guide begins with a basic discussion of DC plans within the larger context of retirement savings in Canada. And in doing so, it reviews topics like what a DC plan is and how it differs from a defined benefit plan. It looks at how income from a DC plan can work together alongside other sources of retirement income, such as CPP, OAS, and GIS to meet the needs of a member in retirement. And it also reviews some of the benefits of saving in a DC plan relative to other options that may be available. And as you can see from the slide, this includes things like the tax benefits that apply to registered plan contributions, um, the ease and convenience of having automatic payroll deductions, and the legal standards that apply to registered plans under various provincial pension standards legislation. So that type of general discussion of DC plans forms the first part of the document. And the remainder of the document then reviews seven different topic areas, each of which are really important areas for member decision-making or just important concepts to understand with respect to DC plans. If you go through the document, you'll see that it follows a hypothetical individual named Martha as she makes different choices with respect to her plan. And the guide highlights the impact that each of those decisions ultimately have on her income in retirement. And I'll just take a few minutes and uh, look at each of those seven different topic areas very briefly. Um, and perhaps we can go to the next slide here. Great. Um, so first the document reviews the importance of enrolling early to accumulating retirement savings. And in doing so, it provides some explanation of the effect of compounding. And it looks at three individuals who enroll in the same plan, but at different ages and using the same savings assumptions. So it shows the eventual retirement savings and income that each of these individuals accumulates. Um, next slide, please. And the next section looks at the importance of making adequate contributions to support the income that a member needs or wants in retirement. Um, it looks at our hypothetical individual, Martha, as she decides to contribute an extra $100 per month to her pension, which in her case, her employer matches. And it shows a significant impact that those extra contributions ultimately have on her income in retirement. Uh, next slide, please. The document then discusses the impact that fees can have in the accumulation of retirement savings. It indicates that while lower fees are not necessarily always preferable, members should be aware of the fees that they're paying and the services that those fees provide for. Uh, next slide, please. The following section then discusses the importance of members choosing the investments that are right for them. So it provides a bit of information about different types of investment options that are often available in many plans. And it emphasizes that there are usually tools and resources that can help members make their decisions. It also notes that members who are unsure of what options to choose may want to consider seeking financial advice. Uh, next slide, please. So the next section deals with decumulation and it looks at three hypothetical individuals who each make different decisions as to how to withdraw their money during retirement. So one individual elects to purchase an annuity Another decides to transfer their money into a retirement product, providing for a variable drawdown in each year, so something like a lift. The third, Martha, isn't sure what to do, so she seeks financial advice. And after receiving financial advice, she decides to allocate her money towards a mix of the first two options. The document notes that many people are like Martha and can benefit from finding the right type of financial advice. Uh, next slide, please. And the next section deals with the importance of longevity risk in planning for retirement. So it notes that at age 65, many people often underestimate their expected longevity, and it encourages people to plan for the possibility that they might live longer than they think. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, the last section examines the important interaction between retirement age and income in retirement. And in doing so, it looks at three plan members who are on the same savings path, but ultimately decide to retire at different ages. It highlights the difference in savings and income for an individual who retires at age 60, for example, as compared to an individual in the same circumstances 
who continues saving until age 70. So that generally concludes our overview of the DC guide. And I'll now turn it over to my colleagues, Chuck and Mark, who will have a bit of a discussion around some additional developments and next steps. So over to you, Chuck and Mark, and thanks everyone. There, there we are. Okay. Thank you, Jesse and Nadine. Um, so Chuck and I are up next here. And uh, I think I have the easiest part of this whole presentation. I'm talking about things that we're going to do coming up uh, in the months and years to come. The committee uh, clearly encouraged us to, to uh, continue to evaluate our resources and tools that can help employers and to continue to work with industry, governments, and other regulators in improving the regulation of DC plans. And, and, and we fully intend to, and have already started down that road to do that. Um, I would say that we would welcome, uh, you know, suggestions uh, from anyone in the industry uh, about areas where we can make improvements. Um, the third sort of overall recommendation there was in the future to, to make sure that uh, we keep CAPSA informed of what we're doing in order that um, other jurisdictions that are, belong to CAPSA can sort of see what we're doing and then perhaps uh, do some of the same things. Um, and also that CAPS itself can, can uh, you know, modify what it publishes from time to time. Um, just one example on the CAPSA front, uh, there is a CAPSA committee that's been meeting and will continue to meet <clears throat> looking at uh, decumulation and, and one of the decumulation options being the new VPLAs. Um, and so both OSFI and, and FISRA are participating in that uh, committee. And I just note that one of the you know, main goals that we have going forward is harmonization. Um, I think everyone's sick of having 10 different sets of rules applying to various uh, DC plan uh, uh, options and, and, uh, and things that are available. Uh, so uh, next page, David. I'll just go into a little bit of detail about what we at FISRA are doing right now and, and, and in the few months to come. Um, we are taking a hard look at everything we do in the regulation of DC plans. Um, of course, what I mean is, you know, what, what do we review? What do we ask for from our DC plan sponsors and administrators? Um, we, we are looking at, for instance, our annual information return filing. Um, and we have today you know, gone through that, uh, removed certain questions that we think didn't really serve much of a uh, purpose, some of which were probably you know, carryovers from uh, defined benefit plan <laughs> right, uh, filings. Um, so trying to streamline those filings and only ask for, for information that's helpful. We've also looked at adding uh, a couple of, of simple questions to give us data that we can then give to the industry that I think would be very helpful. Uh, things such as uh, asking for information about the number of investment options made available to DC members, um, asking for information on the average fees paid by or uh, with respect to uh, funds that made available in these plans and also taking on the role of asking about whether uh, funds, ESG style funds are offered or not. Um, so that revised filing content will probably be out sometime next year. Um, and before that happens, we will also be uh, you know, discussing with other people in, in the industry to get feedback on it. Um, and finally, uh, we, we are working with, in our case, our Ontario government uh, to look at any regulatory, certain regulatory changes that could be made to uh, assist uh, with DC plans. And you may have noticed that in the last few weeks, the Ontario government uh, posted a uh, information about proposed changes that they are making or tend to make regarding DC plans. One is to cease requiring the filing of a statement of investment policies and procedures for DC plans. And the second is to do away with the requirement for an external audit of financial statements for DC plans. 
So I think those are two really, really useful changes um, that will hopefully be in place in, in the uh, next few months. I think that's it for now. I'm gonna hand it over to Chuck. He'll talk a bit about OSPI and then uh, we'll move on to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. So from OSFI's perspective, we will apply the insights gained through the committee to further develop our supervisory framework for federally regulated pension plans. We're currently reviewing filing requirements for DC plans and hope to be able to share any changes as a result of our review for the 2022 year ends for filings that are due for June 2023 and later. As part of OSFI's review of the filing requirements, OSFI will be looking at various items to see if we could streamline our regulatory from framework in terms of DC plans, including issuing guidance outlining OSFI expe expectations with regards to the contribution planner, such as the frequency of providing such planner to the custodian, and when does the custodian have to notify OSFI. We believe the contribution planner is a powerful tool for OSFI's supervision of DC plans, and therefore imperative that we clarify our expectations regarding its use. We will look at potentially focusing on loosing, loosening rather, the requirements for, or even exempting the filing requirements for auditor's report for most DC plans. And we will be reviewing the annual information re return, it's the OSFI 49, and the financial statements, the OSFI 60, required filings to see if there are to see there to see if there are um, um, if there are opportunities where uh, these could be streamlined. Pardon me. In addition, as part of our review, we will potentially consider issuing or reviewing existing guidance on DC plans. With regards to the SIP, the Statement of Investment Policies and Procedures the Pension Benefit Standards Act and the regulations do not require pension plans to file their SIPs with OSFI, which the committee told us that was appreciated. At this time, we don't foresee any changes in this regard. With regards to the default option and auto features, these were discussed in depth at the committee. Regarding the default option, OSFI already has guidance on selecting default, default investment options, which can be found on our website. Regarding the auto enrollment, auto escalation features, OSFI hasn't published any guidance on this yet. While the Pension Benefit Standards Act and regulations do not prohibit these features, it is our understanding that there may be some limitations under the Employment Standards legislation that prohibit payroll deductions without the express consent of the employee. OSFI intends to review this further, but any guidance on this topic would have to reflect the potential application of the employment standards legislation. With regards to the electronic filings, OSFI has in place an electronic filing system via the regulatory reporting system, where plan administrators would file OS, would file with OSFI their pension plan information, such as their annual information return, their financial information, and plan amendments. The electronic filing of plan amendments is a fairly new feature and has been in effect since April 2020. And with regards to the re regulatory reporting system, we have received feedback over the past few years that this system is not user-friendly and very difficult to access. We understand the frustrations this can cause you, and we apologize. This system is a, tri a tri agency system, which is used by the Bank of Canada, CDIC, OSFI, as well as banks and the insurance industry to gather and process regulatory returns, was designed first and foremost to make it very secure to protect the information gathered. Thank you. We will now move to the question and answer period. I believe we have probably a little over 20 minutes for that. Um, 
So we want to make this uh, an, an interactive session. Therefore, we will ask you to submit any questions via the Slido application. To access Slido, please open another, brow another, uh, another browser on your computer or mobile device and go to slido.com. Where to ask, please enter the event code FISRA OSFI. That's F-S-R-A-O-S-F-I, and password is also FISRA OSPI. Once logged in, you can submit your question. You can also vote for the question you'd like to, us to answer. If we do not have enough time to answer all Slido questions, or if we're unable to answer it today, please refer to the email addresses on the screen and send your questions to the appropriate email inbox. As a reminder also, please feel free to ask your question either in French or English. Okay, uh, we received several pre-submitted uh, questions prior to the webinar, and we'll answer a couple of these ones first. Some of the questions were addressed throughout the presentation and others were responded to directly prior to the webinar. However, if you feel that we have not responded to your pre-submitted question during the presentation, please feel free to ask your question again through Slido, or you may simply send us your question by email at the appropriate email address. Okay. Um... Got one question here that I think Mike Hughes from OSFI could answer. I'll read that one out. How does OSFI measure the efficiency of the employer pension plans registered with OSFI apart from the audits? Are there any specific tools that employers can use to see where they stand and what could the potential risks for their plan? Something that suggests beyond the regular administration and government's governance improvements. Mike, can I hand that over to you? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Chuck. Um, so OSFI continually monitors individual plans as well as uh, other developments surrounding their sponsors and sponsor industries. Uh, we do that to our, to, in order to identify potential risks. Um, examinations are one aspect of our supervision and represents one of the most in-depth uh, measures. Um, however, in addition to in examinations, uh, we monitor our plans through several tools, such as our estimated solvency ratio exercise uh, and our tiered risk indicators, which are tests run on the data from annual returns. So I guess one thing I'd say is while we certainly have insights into risks from our experience with a large variety of plans. Um, I would also suggest that individual pension plans are in an excellent position, potentially better than us, to identify some of the risks that are unique to their own plans. Um, if you're looking at uh, trying to find some support in determining those risks or how we might look at a pension plan and, and develop your own sort of uh, risk assessment of your plan, um, I'd suggest having a look at our risk assessment framework for financially, or sort of, sorry, for federally regulated private pension plans, which can be found on our website. Um, under this framework, OSFI internally rates individual plan pension plans risks as low, moderate, above average, or high. Uh, and we also rate the quality of risk management. So think controls and oversight. With this, we arrive at a composite risk rating or overall risk rating, uh, as well as a direction that risk is moving. Uh, so increasing, stable, decreasing. So for the framework, there's an overview document, as well as six separate guidance notes that sort of delve into the various aspects of the framework. Um, we don't share these individual ratings or the overall ratings with plans or the industry at large. But I think if you had a look through those documents, you could pretty easily get an idea of where any individual plan might land uh, through those guidance notes. Um, additionally, we'll always suggest having a look at the CAPSA guidelines, particularly the governance guidelines self-assessment, uh, which can help plan administrators assess how successfully their pension plan follows best practices and uh, governance principles. Chuck? 
Great, thanks, Mike. Um, the next question here, I, I think Mark Eagles from FISDRA could answer this one. Uh, I'm gonna read it out here, Mark, for you. Recently, the Ontario government announced draft regulations that will eliminate the need for Ontario member directed DC plans, DC only plans to have SIPs. If that regulation is adopted with FISRA still recommend SIPs as a prudent practice for such plans? Over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Um, I guess I would say, first of all, we the, the change really is about filing stuff with us. So we don't, if that regulation change goes through, there'll be no need to, uh, to produce or file those SIPs with us. Um, however, I, I think most people would recognize that in almost all DC plans, the funds that are made available to members have their own SIP. Each fund has a SIP saying how it's invested. And, and, and that's the key document that plan administrators need to have access to when they're deciding on what funds to make available. And, and also they, they need to be available to members for those members who do want to, to see that. Um, so we would expect that that would continue. I mean, that's a part of governance um, and what, what we're really, or what the regulation change is doing is saying that that SIP for the pension plan itself is not necessary. Most of those SIPs really just included all the SIPs of the underlying pension funds or investment funds that are made available. Um, so I, I hope that answers that question. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, we did receive, Mark, you stay online here because I think you'd be best fit to answer this one here. We received another set of sort of three questions that go all together um, that were pre-submitted. I can read them out uh, to you here. Let me read them out to you. Maybe you can take a couple of points on, on what they are. Um, so should companies allow employees to top up their DC pension plan by allowing extra contributions? as contributions under the deeply plan, DB plan are mandatory. This was followed by is 5% of the base salary still appropriate level, an appropriate level of funding for DC plan. What is, uh, what is the average funding level? And then finally uh, that came along with that is what, would, what should companies be doing uh, to encourage staff to review their DC plan investments regularly? Mark? Okay, I'll, I'll try and be quick because I, I think this question maybe has some specific plan elements to it, but generally as a regulator, uh, we're all for more. <laughs> um, so if a plan wants to uh, permit members to contribute more, I, I can't really see a downside to that in almost every case. Um, and, and that would be true whether it's a, a DC standalone plan or a DC that's provided in combination with a defined benefit plan. Um, the 5% base salary, I, I assume is a plan specific thing. Although I, I, I do think that, like I've seen many, many surveys over the years and, and information from Stats Canada and so on. And probably the average employer contribution was somewhere around five or 6%. Um, although it, it will change or it will vary greatly between industries. Um, so I, I don't think there is a uh, one size fits all. It really depends on the, you know, the purpose of the plan. Uh, many DC plans are provided a, as a you know, sort of side piece to something else. Um, so I, I don't think we can say there's one uh, contribution level that sort of is the right level for everyone. Although generally more is better in, in most cases. Um, and uh, reviewing investments regularly and, and, and encouraging members to do that. I, I don't think we have any magic uh, potion to achieve that. Um, that we, uh, I think uh, Jesse or uh, someone earlier touched on, on some issues around uh, member engagement. And, and so it's a, it's a big issue, um, but I don't think I have a, a, no, no magic answer to that question at this time. Okay, well, that's great. Thanks, Mark. Um, we will now turn over to the questions on Slido. I'm just looking at Slido here. Um, 
Let me start with a question on, uh, on the CAPSA recommendations. I'll read that out. And I would probably wager that Mike would probably would wanna answer that. Um, so the question is, how did CAPSA respond to your recommendations? Mike, can I send that over to you or? or sure, no? Chuck. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, so CAPSA have not formally responded. However, um, we were invited to present an overview of these recommendations to CAPSA in July. Um, in addition, the, the recommendations have come up in our sort of regular ongoing interactions with CAPSA and the, GAP, the CAPSA CAP guideline committee has undertaken to review and consider the recommendations uh, to determine whether they're appropriate additions to the CAP guidelines. Uh, their, that committee is continuing its work and is expected to post its revised guidelines for consultation in spring of uh, 2022. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Mike. Um, here's a question. Actually, I'm looking at this next question here on income projections. And then there's another one uh, down as well that talks about uh, the assumptions. How did you arrive to the assumptions? So I think those two could go together. Um, just thinking out loud here, probably Jesse would want to answer this one here. So the question is the income projection scenarios don't disclose the assumptions used to convert the future account balance to a monthly income stream, why not? Jesse, do you wanna take a stab at that one? Sure. Um, so if you look at uh, page seven of the DC member guide, you'll see a little note about um, how those projections were arrived at. Now, it, it might not include um, you know, every assumption, but it, but it reads sort of generally uh, all examples are based on an assumption of typical life expectancies and do not differentiate according to the sex of the member. So use um, blended annuity rates. Um, they assume the member will use their savings to purchase a single life annuity and estimates are based on an interest rate of 3.0. Um, so some of the key assumptions are there. Um, that might not be, um, you know, every assumption that went into those calculations. Um, but I think, you know, in producing this document, we were often had to make the, the sort of um, decision between making it a bit more accessible to members and including um, more technical detail. And I think, you know, that that sort of note there tries to, to you know, be on that, on that line. Um, but, you know, if there are further questions about the assumptions that were used, um, feel free to reach out and we can give you a bit more background on that. Um, so just basically the only reason that they're, they're not in the guide is just we thought it might make the guide a bit too technical for members. Um, in terms of the, the other assumptions that were used, um, I think it's fair to say that, that FISRA, OSPI, and the Technical Advisory Committee all kind of recognize that there's no one perfect set of assumptions you could use for a document like this. Um, there's a range of reasonable assumptions and people might disagree on exactly what the best one is, but we thought that the, um, the important thing to do was pick uh, assumptions that were within that reasonable range and use them consistently. Um, so you'll see that kind of reflected. Um, we did have discussions and debates about uh, exactly what assumptions were most appropriate. Um, we think that we landed um, somewhere within that reasonable range. Um, and we sought actuarial input from our team, um, you know, when the, when the assumptions had an actuarial component. Um, probably the area that we had the most discussion on was the contribution levels, um, which are set for Martha at $100 per month. Um, some people might feel that that's uh, a little bit too low for other people that that might feel like, you know, a significant budgetary item in a month. And I think that um, at the end of the day, we tried to go with contribution levels that would be accessible to individuals earlier in their career. So, well, they might be a little bit lower than what a mid-career or late-career person would be contributing to their plan. Um, hopefully, it's a number that, you know, somebody who's just thinking about getting into a DC plan or thinking about contributing, um, it doesn't seem too intimidating to them. So... Um, hopefully that clears things up a bit. Good, thanks, Jesse. I'm not sure if you want to stay on for that one as well. If not, let me know. Uh, the next question, here's a question on income projection scenarios. I think that was addressed, so okay. Um, so here's a question, actually, maybe it is it is for you. So will, will there be specific guidance as to what level of fees, example, 1% of assets? is considered reasonable or unreasonable. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you want to take that one, Jesse, or maybe James. What do you think? I can say we don't we don't have any plans for that for that type of guidance. Um, you know, the the recommendations to CAPSA are are more along that vein, but but specifically from from FISRA, no. And, and maybe James can jump in and provide a bit more context. Yeah, I, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's right. I think setting a setting a fee would be more of a policy discussion, perhaps than necessarily a, a supervisory. I think what's important for uh, you know, any plan administrator or a plan sponsor of another cap plan is always to consider the process by which they uh, they they get information to make informed decisions to make sure they have the relevant information and uh, are making appropriate decisions in the context of their plan. Very good, thanks, James. Uh, okay, so here's uh, sorry, did I... Mark have a did you? No, I think we're good. Okay. I, I was going to say one thing there. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. I, I was just going to say too that the, on the fee side of things, it, it, it'd be very difficult to, to have a one size fits all, you know, 1% is the, the fee you want to see because it will vary greatly between the type of fund involved and the size of the plan. Um, and to really be meaningful, you would have to give a breakdown of you know, average fees across 20 different types of funds and, and, and different asset sizes and all that. Uh, so I, th I think that's beyond our scope at this time, beyond our, the data that we even have at this time. Um, you know, someday maybe some office uh, has all data on all funds made available with fees clearly uh, on a comparable basis, and, and and that data can be made available, but uh, I don't not not sure that that exists right now. At least not in not in our office. Okay, well, thanks, Mark. Uh, I think the next one I will loop that one back to Mike. Uh, can industry participants make suggestions to OSFI and FISRA about what additional changes would be best? If so, who should we contact, Mike? Um, yeah, I, um, uh, as you can see on the screen here, we've got we've got some contact information. Um, absolutely, we're happy to hear uh, about uh, you know other suggestions. So I would encourage you to send emails to the appropriate email address on the screen. Okay, thanks, Mike. So here's a question, an interesting question. I might have to get to Mara to potentially think of this one, Tamara, here's a question. Are FISRA and OSFI thinking about suggesting to the legislatures, Ontario and federal, to introduce a safe harbor provision for DC plans as we see in the US? Tamara, would you mind looking at this one or? Um, yeah, I guess uh, um, if I'm trying to remember the safe harbor is like, if you kind of follow these rules, then uh, this is to encourage, I think, after retirement um, to, for defined contribution plans to continue after retirement. And these are, our intention was not, like we, that was not part of the scope of this, uh, of this review. Um, and it really is kind of a policy discussion. It really is for, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it, it, uh, it's for our colleagues at the, Department of Finance and Ministry of Finance to kind of consider those those policies, and we had not through this process looked at that. I don't know if any of my other my colleagues uh, wanted to kind of elaborate on that. Any takers, James, Mark? Okay, thank you, Tamara. Uh, so this is, uh, I think, Jesse, you might want to answer on this question here. When can we expect the DC guide for plan sponsors to be released? I guess we already talked about this one. Let's see. 
Well, so the DC uh, guide for members is, is released on CAPSA's uh, website yeah. already um, in terms of a guide for plan sponsors. Um, we don't have anything specific in the works. Um, if it's, you know, talking about the, the CAPSA guideline um, for CAP plans, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the timeline is on that um, for the update to that document. Um, others might, might know better than me. I think, um, sorry, Chuck, it's Tamara, but Mike had mentioned that they're continuing their work and expecting to post the revised guideline for consultation in spring of 2022. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Jesse. So the next question is, why did OSFI FISRA go to CAPSA with these recommendations instead of issuing this guidance? Um, James, Mike? Yeah, um, can... yeah, go ahead, James. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chuck. I think I think we had, we had sort of Toyed with, idea, toyed with that idea of, of issuing our own guidance, but uh, I think the committee was was very clear that uh, in order to make things, I think, efficient and harmonious across the, uh, for, you know, in terms of the regulations and guidance for plans to follow, as well as for the various service providers that support the plans, I think what would be most, what would be most advantageous would be to make the recommendations to the CAP guidelines and to see if the recommendations could be accommodated there because uh, that would provide just, just greater regulatory efficiency um, rather than having <clears throat> you know, separate, separate guidance for, for specific jurisdictions. Perfect, thanks, James. We are mindful of time. Uh, we probably have time for just about one quick question here. Maybe I'll ask Mark uh, to this one, uh, to give us a quick response, if that's possible, Mark. When is the CAP guideline going to change? Mark, I know you're on these committees. Do you know if you can? Yeah, I think that's uh, what Tamara was referring to earlier, but the CAP guideline is probably going to be uh, modified and published for comment spring or summer 2022. Um, so people will be able to see what it's been changed or has been changed and they can uh, provide comments at that time. Okay, well, this is great. Uh, this, this brings us to the end of, uh, of the questions and answers at this time. If we were unable to answer your question today, please feel free to email, to send us an email. Um, the slide is on there with the email addresses or actually no, it's on the second last slide of the slide deck. Uh, and send your questions to the appropriate email address. Here we go, it's, it's now on here. So for FISRA, it's david.bertucci uh, at uh, fisra.o.ca. And for OSFI, it's on our general website, pensions at, uh, at osfi-bsif.gc.ca. Perfect. Um, so thank you very much for all those uh, that uh, have uh, submitted the questions and uh, the responses to that. Carolyn, Tamara, this uh, I will pass it to you for closing remarks before we wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck. Um, as luck would have it, I'm in a condo and right outside my window where it's garbage day. So I hope you can all hear me okay. Thank you all for attending today's webinar. Merci à tous d'avoir participé à la session d'aujourd'hui. Thank you to all of us for having participated in the webinar today. And thank you to all of our presenters for sharing their time and insights with all of us today. I would again like to thank the Technical Advisory Committee participants for their time and their valuable insights. A thank you again to Carolyn and her FISRA team for their collaboration. I'd also like to thank the OSPI team, uh, Chuck Saab, Mike Yus, Nadine Atala, and Benoit Briar for their dedication to this project over the last few months. And there's some people I want to mention who are working behind the scenes to make sure this webinar went off without a glitch. That's Jessica Resch and Ronnie Dagger and Karima uh, Shajani. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, 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 go ahead, Carolyn. Thank you so much. It's been a true pleasure working with you and your team. Uh, I will miss 
our frequent meetings, that's for sure, between OSCE and FISRA. It was a pleasure working with the entire committee um, and having discussions. And once again, thank you so much to our colleagues at the CRA, the Ministry of Finance in Ontario, and uh, Finance Canada at the federal level. Um, your support and presence during all of these discussions um, is really valued so and appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs>